Tēnā koutou katoa, nō reira he mihi, ko hākira matas oku maunga, ko Pacifica toku moana, ko Waikato te awa, ko waka rere rangi te waka, ko hau te Afrikana toku iwi, ko horutu toku wahi, ko tokita Michael Ohiliaho, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, invited guests, and friends. I am humbled and honoured to be giving the 2015 Peter Anion Memorial Address. Thank you to Helen Morgan Banda for inviting me to speak today. In a nutshell, I am a South African-born, New Zealand-educated GP registrar with five years' experience in emergency medicine in the Australian outback. I have written three children's books, travelled to 54 countries on six continents, and I'm married to Claire. Our first baby is due this month. Given that Claire is Australian, I'm South African, our surname is German, and we live in New Zealand, the poor child is likely to have an identity crisis, as long as it doesn't support the All Blacks. <laughs> I have been asked to cover three topics today. My journey in general practice, my experience of the GP education program thus far, and my perceptions on the future of general practice. I hope to keep this talk relatively light and entertaining by focusing on some of the funnier aspects of our job, such as the demanding patients shown in this cartoon. I'm sure everyone has a story to tell about the demands placed on us in general practice, like my recent patient, who expected me to complete her WINS sickness benefit certificate, a disability allowance form and paperwork for her ACC claim in the same 15 minute appointment, while also expecting me to address a shopping list of issues such as her chronic back pain, her ankle injury, routine scripts for hypertension and depression, oh, and could I please check these two skin lesions. All while MedTech flashes red lights at me demanding that I complete a CV risk assessment and get her to stop smoking. I'm sure that sounds familiar. This photo, um, taken at the end of our medical training at Waikato Clinical School, shows me with the same people who shared my cadaver table back in second year medical school. Of the six shown, three are now GPs, one is a public health researcher, and the two nutjobs on the right are, predictably, paediatricians. <laughs> At the time, however, I had no intention of becoming a GP. My impression of general practice at medical school was a mixed bag, to say the least. My first GP placement was a dull, damp, overworked urban Auckland practice who had no time to accommodate a student. My second placement was with a chain-smoking South African military doctor who was an excellent teacher but seemed to have an extremely low opinion of the Ministry of Health and an even lower opinion of the college. <laughs> in, in direct contrast, I had a selective placement in rural general practice in Rawini in Northland and a rural general practice placement at Tekawiti both of which were exceptional. And in fact, um, yesterday's talk by Dr. John Burton really uh, reminded me of that. Um, the way those hard-working GPs balance their clinical workload um, with managing their hospital inpatients and the community was inspiring, to say the least. I will be honest with you, it made me nostalgic for a time when GPs truly did everything from birth to death and in between, including delivery, surgery, plaster casting, and more. Sometimes I wonder if I should have been a small town GP in the 1950s, or perhaps I should move to Kafia. <laughs> there is a problem with the way hospital specialists talk about general practitioners, and impress impressionable young medical students and house officers are listening. GPs weren't smart enough to specialise. GPs are useless and dump all their work on hospitals. GPs mismanage problems and hospitals have to clean up the mess. All GPs do is treat coughs and colds and snotty-nosed kids. GPs don't earn any money. These myths and untruths are rampant at medical school and in the hospitals where we spend our formative years of training. It should not be a surprise that attracting people to general practice has been a problem for some time. And it also shouldn't surprise you that at the end of my house officer year, the last thing I wanted to do was general practice. Instead, like more than 30% of my graduating class from Auckland's medical school, I chased the high Australian dollar across the ditch. 
My intentions were to co complete a couple of years as an emergency locum, do some travelling, and then specialise in e either paediatric neurosurgery or paediatric oncology. It would not pan out that way. Something changed while I was in Outback Australia. For a start, I met my future wife, Claire, uh, but from a career point of view, I discovered a secret word unknown to many hospital specialists called lifestyle. I discovered that there is more to life than work. We should work to live, not live to work. The financial freedom I achieved from locum work enabled my travels, brought me time to fulfill my lifelong dream of becoming a published author, and allowed me to decide what my priorities in life were going to be. My five years working in Australian emergency departments were immensely valuable experiences which made me a much better doctor. I have dozens of sometimes hilarious, sometimes painful stories of the things that I saw during that time. Like the bloke who walked down the hospital corridor pooing as he walked. Uh, the bloke who kept popping into the emergency department requesting that the nurses insert a urinary catheter that he didn't need. The intoxicated teenager whose friends planted him with glitter glue while he lay unconscious on the concrete, vomiting cheap red wine. And the 19-year-old who presented to emergency with a, a sore penis, not realising that his girlfriend must have accidentally bitten him. The 247-kilogram man so heavy that the ambulance's axle broke while transporting him to a tertiary facility. I saw everything you could possibly imagine during five years in emergency, with the exception of meningococcal meningitis. I never saw one case. These are just a handful of the thousands of photos I took during my travels around the world between 2008 and 13. I've got um, top left the ruins of Monte Alban in Mexico, some Nicaraguan volcanoes top middle, and the legendary ruins of Machu Picchu, top right. Bottom left, the Iguazu Falls in Brazil, the Terracotta Army in Xi'an, and the Himalayas on the Annapurna Circle, Circuit. Travel is a passion of mine, and I have plans to combine travel medicine with my general family practice, but I will come back to that. What traveling the world taught me is that I didn't want to become a hospital specialist. I couldn't see the value of signing away the best five or six or eight years of my life in some endless specialty training program. I no longer wanted to be subject to hospital bureaucracy or politics, and I began to see general practice as a possible solution. Five years of working in emergency departments left me emotionally and profes professionally burned out and drained of motivation. I grew cynical, bitter and jaded from dealing with alcohol-related injuries, drug abuse, domestic violence and neglected children such as the 12-year-old boy who bawled his eyes out while he told me that his grandfather had raped him and nobody in his family believed him. They all thought that he was just a difficult ch child, a truant and a dropout. Australia's appalling indigenous health was one thing. On the other hand, you had drug seekers and obnoxiously rude, demanding patients. I began to counter-transfer many of the traits you find in emergency department patients. Anger, impatience, entitlement, self-absorption, and the belief that their problem is more important than anyone else's. Emergency medicine at times made me into a hateful person who did not like human beings. General practice then was my saviour. As I mentioned earlier, I had never specifically seen myself as a GP, but the option had always been at the back of my mind. Why? I think I can point directly to my own GP growing up here in Hamilton, Dr. Mike Watson. This man has treated my family for over two decades, and every memory I have of doctor's visits as a child was positive. From the warmth and sensitivity of his approach to the depth of his understanding as he dealt with all the various problems we as a family brought to him, Dr. Watson was someone in whom I had the utmost respect and admiration. Dr. Mike Watson represents everything that is great about general practice. Here is a man who has dedicated his life to his patients. He lives their stories. He becomes part of the fabric of their lives. He guides them through the illnesses of their early childhood all the way to the slow decline into old age and palliation as they approach the end. Dr. Watson has been a fantastic role model of mine and an inspiration, so it is my great pleasure to have him here as my invited guest. Thank you, Mike, for inspiring me to become a general practitioner. I hope that when I take the reins from you, I will treat your patients with the same devotion, dedication, and compassion that you have throughout your remarkable career.
Once I made the decision to become a GP and my wife and I agreed to make a permanent return to New Zealand, I joined the GP education program in December 2013. My experiences subsequently have been mixed but improved with each placement. I was the subject of some bullying during one of my placements as a first year registrar. Among other things, this person told me that I wasn't cut out for general practice, criticised me in front of the receptionists and patients, and made me feel small and incompetent. I bring this up because bullying is rampant in medicine, particularly in hospitals. Many specialists feel that because their training in the 1920s involved working 100-hour shifts and having things thrown at them by other consultants gives them an excuse to jump on, dump on their junior staff in the same fashion. Therefore, if we are, as general practitioners, to succeed in attracting doctors out of hospitals into the community, we must ensure that bullying has no place in our profession. What I experienced was unacceptable and should not be tolerated simply because people are too politically correct to call a spade a spade. My second placement at a model of care practice was light years better. I had supportive colleagues, fantastic nurses and healthcare assistants, friendly receptionists and a great team atmosphere. If I could make one comment about model of care, however, it would be this. The intense focus on cost saving does not necessarily always translate into improved patient outcomes. We must not lose sight of the fact that the patient-doctor interface is at the heart of good medicine. You can't always replace doctors with nurse practitioners and physician assistants and expect the same outcome. I'm also concerned by the fact that many general practitioners seem to be moving towards a futuristic vision of sleek, accident and emergency style clinics where patient flow and other buzzwords do predominate. I don't think it's a move forward, I think it's a step backwards. I have enough experience of emergency departments to know that they are not patient focused and do not facilitate good long term care of human health. If, they want, if patients want to go to an emergency department, they will go to an emergency department. And I'd like to think that we can keep general practice rooted in the principle of the doctor-patient relationship. So what do these pictures have to do with the price of fish, you might be asking? Well, my current GP practice is an inclusive family practice of the old model, where the nurses and doctors foster lifelong relationships with their patient community. This is where I would like to stay. I feel like I finally have life figured out. My wife and I have a beautiful home with our three oldest children, Janet Jackson Cat, Morgan Freedog, and Roger Fedrador, <laughs> and a baby on the way. Um, I've published three children's books and try to squeeze an hour of writing into my day most mornings. Then four days a week, I work at Five Crossroads Medical Center, which is literally 800 meters up the road from this convention center. I intend on becoming a practice partner and working there for the bulk of my career. So I've come full circle. Once was a high-flying type A medical school personality who wanted to be a world-leading pediatric neurosurgeon, and now I feel like I'm more of a laid-back type B personality who has realized what really matters, preventative primary health care, being a part of the community, and focusing on friends, pets, children, my wife, my family, and being happy. As I mentioned earlier, travel medicine is a passion of mine and I'm presently completing a postgraduate diploma of travel medicine through the University of Otago. This will allow me to supplement my family practice with travel consultations as well as my skills in minor skill, skin surgery. I've joined the Waikato faculty of the college and in future would like to be involved in the training of registrars and medical students and so the cycle can turn around. At this point I would like to thank those people who have been most instrumental in helping me to reach this point in my life. My parents, John and Eileen, who left South Africa to give me and my siblings better opportunities in New Zealand. And my wife, Claire, who left Australia to move across the ditch because, let's be honest, New Zealand has better weather. <laughs> so I've been asked to talk a little bit about how I see the future of general practice. And as this cartoon demonstrates, we have a problem. Too much information. Too many ways of patients to con for patients to contact us. Too many sources of work. Specialist letters, ED discharge letters, hospital discharge letters, rest home jobs, hospice letters, patient visits, patient emails, patient phone calls, pharmacies, other allied health professions, and the list goes on. I am conflicted by this. Some days I'm enormously optimistic about our profession. I believe that we are the future of good medicine, the beating heart of it all. And other days I'm profoundly depressed by the prospect of medicine drowning in paperwork and the constant fear of patient complaints reaching the HDC. So for the sake of levity, I'll keep my thoughts on the future of GP to three key points. I just stole that picture from Google. Um, 
I believe that the most significant changes are coming soon in the next few years as we move towards a system of integrated medical record systems across all health care professions. Imagine a world where private and public specialists, hospitals, nursing homes, hospice, pharmacies, physios, uh, OTs, social workers, midwives, and all general practices are able to access a grand unified medical record system, or GUMAs for short. Notwithstanding the obvious privacy issues and challenges of getting everyone to agree on a standardized computer program, I do believe it is eventually going to happen. Some computer nerd will surely be smart enough to create privacy bar barriers which keep certain patient information private while allowing the GP, as the patient's primary healthcare coordinator, to navigate the entire scope of their medical information. Because let's face it, the best way to ensure that our patients are being treated properly is if we actually know what the social worker did on the home visit last week, what the counsellor said last Friday, what mes medications the specialist added yesterday, and exactly when the hospital has booked the patient's colonoscopy and x-ray uh, next month. It'll probably save our nurses a lot of time so they don't have to call the hospital and spend 20 minutes listening to elevator music trying to find out when the colonoscopy is. Again, I have to apologize for the racist Google picture. Apparently, Google doctors only treat white people. <laughs> I also think that we should resist the urge to lose touch with the old ways of doing things. I don't think we should forget the importance of continuity of care, building relationships over time, the family practice model, and the benefits that entails. It might be more profitable to employ an army of salary GPs to churn through 40 patients a day that they've never met before and will never meet again because your clinic has 25 doctors and 40,000 patients on its book. But I'm not sure that that will improve the population's health. I know from my experience in emergency medicine that you can't provide comprehensive medical care to a patient you only meet once. So if we as a country are to meet the healthcare challenges of an aging, increasingly overweight, increasingly diabetic, arthritic, demented or cancer afflicted population, which is true, we must rise to the challenge with an army of committed GPs who treat the patient as a whole, patient, a whole person to be managed for life, not an acute medical problem to be solved, charged $46 and booted out the door. And my final point about the future of general practice is that we must remain vital, remain the heartbeat of patient care. The more specialised that medicine gets, the more important the GP becomes. Somebody needs to coordinate care, especially when the orthopods and the cardiologists and the neurologists and the interventional radio-oncologists are all speaking past one another and only focusing on their narrow fields of interest. We have to be the true jack of all trades, experts in nothing and masters of everything. The age of Dr. Google will only make this more difficult, but I'm sure that we can manage. I leave with that cartoon because I think it um, illustrates the Dr. Google story quite well. <laughs> it has been my great pleasure and honour to address the college conference today. General practice is now my profession, livelihood and passion. I look forward to many years of collegiality with all of you as we collectively seek to keep New Zealanders healthy and happy and remain sane while doing so. Thank you.